Our speaker today is Dr. Tim Conway, who is a PhD in clinical psychology with a concentration in neuropsychology from the University of Florida. His background as a clinical research scientist has produced research in the areas of dyslexia, learning disabilities, stroke, aphasia, and other disorders. He's the director of the Morris Center Clinics in Ocala, Florida, as well as Trinidad and Tobago, West Indies, which for 33 years have provided a transdisciplinary approach to the assessment and treatment of neurodevelopmental disorders. He is founder and president of the board of directors of the Einstein School in Gainesville, Florida, which is the first 501c3 school, charter school in the U.S. to provide free education to kids in grades two through eight who all have specific learning disabilities or dyslexia. In addition to all of this, he's the founder and CEO of Neurodevelopment Words of Words Now, an ed tech company that translates evidence-based and research-based programs into online one-to-one e-tutoring services to children's, teens, and adults worldwide. As we all take care of patients who have learning disabilities and dys dyslexia, but most of us do not have any training in this, I can say that we speak for all of us in saying we have a lot to gain from Dr. Conway's talk today. So please join me in welcoming him. Hi, good afternoon. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so yes, I'm a pediatric and adult neuropsychologist um, with lots of expertise in learning disabilities, language disorders, which turned out to be a really good thing because dyslexia doesn't run in my family, it actually gallops through my family. So unbeknownst to me, when I started this career, I ended up with two children who both have dyslexia, ADHD, sensory processing disorders, dysgraphia, the daughter also had the dyscalculia, and she also had the oral dyspraxia. So fortunately for me and for them, I have a bit of expertise in that area. So <clears throat> the talk today is a lot of information. It's mostly focused on the empirical studies we published in peer-reviewed journals. It focuses on the three five-year randomized controlled trial studies that we did in partnership with Florida State University. Um, and it talks about the implications and the application of that evidence-based practice into the educational sector. For those of you who don't know, and you probably aren't surprised, science does not drive what happens in the educational sector. Education is driven by ideology and philosophy, and that really needs to change and move towards an evidence-based approach, and I hope to have convinced you why by the end of this talk today. My disclosures, as uh, Aaron talked about, my affiliations with the medical clinic, the online ed tech company. I'm an affiliated research assistant professor at University of Florida, which is I did my training, and also the volunteer director and, and uh, one of the founders of the Einstein School in Gainesville, Florida which thankfully is a free 501c3 nonprofit school only for dyslexia and other types of learning disabilities. We set up that school to try to show educational sector that when we have a lower budget than what a public school has and we outpace you on double, triple, and quadruple the gains and academic gains of progress, then do not tell parents that you don't have the funding to do a better job. That's absolutely not true and it has to stop being the excuse. So what does dyslexia look like? If you can't see it and you don't really know it, let me give you a very clear picture. So this boy is 8 to 10 years old, he's in elementary school, he has an IEP, he's in special ed, and he still can't read very well. So that's what dyslexia looks like to a parent, to a child, and it also has a high degree of frustration. It's very possible that one of our primary sources of trauma experiences for children today is school. Because when you go to a school environment daily and you're shown again and again that you can't do the activities that your classmates can do, it does not bolster your self-esteem. It does not boost your self-confidence. And it has very significant impacts. So how do we diagnose it? Let's be clear, the DSM-5 has a, a redefined criteria as of its uh, origin in October of 15. The most prominent learning disorder is difficulties in academic skills of slow and effortful reading. It's a specific learning disorder with impairment of reading, and it really is only three areas that really require deficit to be diagnosed. 
If you have a disorder in reading accuracy, you'll be diagnosed. If it's a disorder in reading fluency, that meets criteria for diagnosis. If it's a disorder in reading comprehension, that is enough for a diagnosis of dyslexia. And I'm saying dyslexia because specific learning disorder with impairment in reading has been proven and shown in the DSM to say these three deficits are actually synonymous with the term dyslexia. Dyslexia is not a different disorder. It doesn't have a different presentation. According to the DSM, this is how it's diagnosed, and either classification is the same criteria. But the most important take-home message for you guys today is its core deficit is believed to be a speech perception, speech processing problem called phonological awareness. And I'll explain more about that later on. The literacy problems we have in the U.S. today are far more than just dyslexia, and it has to be, because here's some data from our annual, or sorry, our biannual measures of reading in fourth graders, eighth graders, and twelfth graders. We measure the reading skills every two years, and what you're going to see here is from 1992 until 2017, we've had the same outcome. So in 25 years, only 36 percent of children in fourth grade, eighth grade, and twelfth grade are proficient readers. Proficient means grade level for accuracy, grade level for fluency, and grade level for comprehension. Keep in mind, though, that grade level means 25th percentile. It's a very low bar. And even with the low bar of the 25th percentile, for more than 30 years, our academic system is only helping 36% of children become proficient readers. 60-plus percent of children cannot have dyslexia. It doesn't exist with that prevalence. At a high-end estimate, it's going to be maybe 20%. So that tells us the current methodology of ideology, philosophy get, governing what's being done in the school systems is a major potential contributor to why the schools are not making better outcomes for literacy gains. When I say literacy gains, what's really possible? Let me show you what dyslexia looks like if you've had a randomized controlled trial, evidence-based instructional program to try to remediate the core deficits. Watch very carefully affect changes as well, because when you read better, it not only impacts your academic performance, it can impact your self-esteem and your mental health. That boy has made a couple grades of gain in his reading skills. Guess how much intervention he's had? Try eight weeks. So from the first video to the second video, that was eight weeks of intervention. In our evidence-based randomized controlled trial, it was actually 67.5 hours of instruction. So there is markedly better outcomes possible if we're using evidence-based instructional methods. So. <clears throat> It's important to use evidence-based methods because dyslexia not only impacts your academic skills, it can have a dramatic impact on your mental health, your psychiatric disorders, and other areas as well. Of the 10 leading causes in death in the U.S., it used to be number three, and it now has moved to number two. Suicide is our number two killer of 10 to 13, sorry, 10 to 34-year-olds. In two separate studies that analyzed suicide notes from teenagers, 89% of the suicide notes had the same spelling mistakes as somebody with dyslexia. So we think these learning difficulties are added stressors that lead to poor choices like suicide and very bleak outcomes or views of what their future could be. In 2015, I gave a TED Talk to try to start this movement of let's move mixing oil and water together, trying to use that analogy that education and science can no longer be oil and water. We have to bring the two together. If we don't, we're not going to see a change in these literacy rates being only 36 percent. Harvard Graduate School faculty have proposed that there needs to be an FDA of education. I would hope not. I would hope we can actually just perf perfect the delivery of evidence-based training in the college programs for the colleges of education and get far better outcomes. But let's be clear, what's more complicated than rocket science? It's experience-dependent neuroplasticity, which is what drives the interventions used for dyslexia and learning disorders. <clears throat> Older neurodevelopmental models have talked about sensory integration, and there's some controversial pieces of that, but newer randomized controlled trials show there may be some validity to some of these views of a sensory integration component to the development of these foundation, uh, foundational skills. So we know that reading, writing, and arithmetic are extremely complex processes, and they can develop only upon a strong foundation of sensory integration. Visual, auditory, tactile, kinesthetic, these systems build those upper-level skills. 
If you're trained as an OT, you know there's visual, auditory, touch, taste, smell, also vestibular, interoceptive, and proprioceptive. Those are our eight sensory motor systems that build that foundation for those higher level skills. Why do we think it's multisensory? Here's another experiential piece. Sorry, I'm very experientially driven. But I just want you to pay attention to what this person is saying. She has the great distinction of being able to come to an audience like you and being introduced as Dr. Cool. And she's Dr. Cool because her last name is spelled K-U-H-L. But she's also very cool because she has spent 40 years studying the development of speech perception and speech production at only one time point in life, zero to 12 months. So for 40 years, she's an endowed chair at University of Washington in Seattle. She has spent her whole lifetime of career studying the development of speech perception and speech production from zero to 12 months of age. It's that complicated. Okay, here we go. Baba. 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 Okay, what is she saying? What sound or sounds is she making? Don't be shy, take a guess. About 70% of you are gonna agree and 25 to 30% are not. Gaga, anything else? Dada, Faga, okay? Here's what we want you to do. Look any place except for the screen. Look down, look left, look right, close your eyes, whatever. Listen to it without watching her face, and then switch back up and watch her face. See if what you hear and you perceive is the same or different when you look away versus when you look at her mouth. Oops. Okay, here we go. Baba. 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 Now look back at her mouth. Baba. 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 If you're not sure, look away again. Baba. 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 For those of you who don't know, this is called the McGurk effect. What they've done is they've set you up. But it only changes for about 70% of you. Truth be told, one out of five of you in this room are not a great reader. One out of five is in the room are not great spellers. You can thank your parents, it's partly genetic. So what she's saying with her mouth movements is actually gaga. So she's making the mouth movements for gaga, but the audio track I'm playing the whole time is the audio for baba. So for 70% of you, when you look at her, you think you hear gaga or dada or something else, but you do not think you hear baba because your eyes see that her lips never touch. And her mouth can't say baba if her lips don't touch. When you look away and you're getting acoustic only input, you perceive baba, because that's actually what the ear is hearing the whole time anyway. But what this shows us is when you have a stronger phonological system and it is multisensory based, your visual will override your acoustic every time. What you see the mouth doing will, come, will definitely override what the ear thinks it's hearing. You guys do it in social situations. When the background noise gets too loud, you look at the speaker's lips. Why? Because it helps you hear better. Well, it's not that their voice got any louder. You're now using some visual, tactile, kinesthetic movement of the mouth to help perceive what's happening acoustically into the ear. So what we want to help highlight is the speech processing that develops for years before written language is not just acoustic. This is not just an auditory phenomenon. It's part acoustic, it's part visual, but we also think it's actually part oral motor, tactile, kinesthetic. So a neurological soft sign that's not been tested empirically but has neurological value to its uh, application is, if you want to find the five-year-old who's most likely going to have the poor phonological awareness system, you come to an event like this with five-year-olds when they're eating lunch. But the ones who have the weaker likelihood of a phonological system are wearing half the food on their face. The ketchup is shoved up their nose, the jello's hanging on their lip, and they, quote, don't feel it because they have decreased sense awareness in the mouth. So for them, their phonological system is going to be more visual acoustic because they're not getting enough tactile kinesthetic input. <clears throat> so back in 1971, an educator at Stanford, a speech pathologist and a linguist, and disclosure, Patricia Lindemood's uh, maiden name is Conway. This is my aunt and uncle. And they began their early research in dyslexia with a paper in 1973, showing that we understand that there's an ability to manipulate these phonetic components of spoken language has a very important bearing on the development of your reading skills. All it's really saying is speech perception develops before reading. 
That should not be a surprise. Children speak before they read and spell. <clears throat> and how do parents speak to children? Well, hopefully they look at them and talk to them face to face because we know from laser eye tracking studies that infants begin watching the parent's mouth move at least by eight months of age. They're watching the lips move, watching the tongue, and they're beginning to get visual, auditory, tactile, kinesthetic feedback just by watching mom and dad speak to them. Why do they do that? Well, here's a very busy slide, but this is part of the four decades of work by Dr. Cool. What I want you to see is the top half is speech perception, the bottom half is speech production. We see sensory learning in the first six months of, a, of life. But there's a perceptual aspect of language development. There's a production aspect of language development. Notice that babies speak vowel sounds first. Consonant sounds come much later. But over time, that speech perception production skill is developing until about six months of age. And then we start to see not only sensory learning, but language-specific speech perception starts to build somewhere between six and 10 months of age. That begins to build in such a way that it's perception, then production, then more perception, more perception, more perception, and then now we get more language-specific production. Then there's more perception, then there's more perception, then there's more production. So there's a dance back and forth in the brain between development of the speech perception skills and development of the baby to actually begin to speak, form those phonemes, say those speech sounds. So in 1987, Wagner and Torgerson from Florida State became some of the leading researchers on phonological processing and began to crank out high-level research showing that the phonological awareness, so that ability to hold on to sounds and manipulate sounds in spoken language. Here's a soft sign for you in clinic. When a parent comes up to you and says that she wants to be specifically clear, that she's really frustrated with some of the things in this clinic and wants to talk to you about the underlying concerns that she has. You're hopefully picking up on her speech errors. She's saying Pacific instead of specific. Or he's saying frustrated instead of frustrated. Or they're saying underlying instead of underlining. And that is a speech perception, speech production error. If the parent continues to make speech perception errors that are not colloquial, it's not how everyone talks in her region of the country, then you're giving, the parent's giving you feedback to say, hey, my family probably has a history of weaker phonological processing. You know that the child you're treating in pediatrics is likely to have an increased likelihood of poor phonological awareness as well. There's a degree of genetics that passes this along. But it not only affects speech processing and speech production, it also affects the foundation of auditory working memory. So when we're talking about auditory working memory, we're talking about memory of words. So what are words made up of? Sounds. And if your phonological perception is weak to develop, you're going to be more likely to be at risk for less working memory of the auditory nature. So Torgerson and Wagner did a five-year longitudinal study trying to pick out what's the best indicator at age five for children who are going to be at risk for reading problems. And they found that the individual differences in their phonological awareness were related to their subsequent differences in their word-level reading skills for every time period measured from K through grade four. So <clears throat> what's the number one predictor of who might become dyslexic or might have weaker phonological skills at age four and five? It's a very simple task. You're going to do it with me. Ready? I'm going to say a word. You just say it back to me. This is not a complex task. Say cat. Now I want you to change it. Say cat, but this time say it without the k sound. Don't say that part. Say what's left. How did you do that? Your input from me was acoustic. You held that word in head. You split the word apart. You take the first sound away, and you put that sound back together. That is called phoneme elision. That is the number one predictor of who is at higher risk for having language problems. It's a very simple bedside thing to do with kids. Another one is you can say flame, they can say flame, you can ask them to say flame without the old sound. You can say mushroom, they say mushroom, you say now say mushroom but don't say mush, they say, say ball. Okay? Your kids who struggle with it and the parents say, well I can't do that either, that gives you another genetic indicator. <clears throat> so that kind of task is what Torgson and Wagner found to be our highest predictor. And others have studied it longitudinally. When you come to school at age seven, and you're in the 20th percentile for your ability to judge and say cat without the k sound, you're on a slower trajectory track for learning phonics. Uh, odds are you're gonna be more than two to three grades behind in your phonics skills by the time you hit fifth grade, just because you came to school with a weaker phonological system. But it doesn't just impact your learning of phonics, it also impacts your learning of sight words, because that phonological system is also a key system for learning sight words. But what's the purpose of reading? Why do we care if kids can read or not? It's reading comprehension. And we see that you're at an even bigger risk for weaker reading comprehension. One, because you read less. Two, because you struggle more to sound out words. Three, you're gonna learn fewer sight words because you're not actually reading as much. And your reading comprehension is probably gonna be at least three to three and a half grade levels behind 
by the time you hit fifth grade. So theoretical models have been proposed. Ken Heilman is a world-renowned behavioral neurologist, and Alexander is a developmental behavioral pediatrician, and Key Develler is a pediatric neurologist. The three of them put a paper in the Annals of Neurology to say, maybe there's a motor articulatory feedback loop that is part of the contributions to the weaker phonological system. Because maybe the ability to associate the position of your teeth, tongue, and lips might impair your development of your phonological awareness system and later make it harder for you to convert sounds to letters and build that letter-sound combination. They wrote a book chapter in the principles, sorry, Neurological Therapeutics, Principles and Practice on the treatment of developmental, uh, developmental language disorders, trying to relay some of that research back to this theoretical model of a developmental picture of the impact of language development on literacy skills. We know that in the 1800s, Pringle Morgan wrote a paper about a boy who had a visual deficit that he thought was of visual dyslexia. He noted there's a family aggregation of that uh, presentation. Orton saw that it was a visual processing problem, thought they actually just couldn't see the letters or see the words properly, and began doing visual memory training for visual graphing memory. And the Lindemoods and the Liebermans began doing phonological awareness training in the 60s and 70s. And we've come to the consensus that it really is a core phonological deficit. So from a developmental model, we know that the phonological system is developing very early on. It is a key system to build expressive language skills. It is a key system for receptive language skills. You want all of your children building the best phonological skills possible, the best expressive language possible, and the best receptive language possible. Because from there, then they start to build semantic knowledge. The vocabulary comes next. Then they start to develop the syntax and sentence structure of words as they speak and talk. Then we get into the written language. Now here we're at reading and spelling skills. But know that most academic settings and schools, when they see a child can't read and spell, their interventions start up here. Their interventions falsely assume that the core foundational system is working properly and working just fine, and they just need to do more work at letters. But the number one predictor of dyslexia has nothing to do with the alphabet. It has everything to do with the speech processing, speech perceptual system. And then you get stronger metalinguistics. But another theoretical model talks about saying, okay, so we've got the biology of genetics potentially impacting the in utero neuronal migration in the left hemisphere. It could then lead to the cognition differences in changes in their phonological awareness, which can contribute to the difficulty in learning letters and sound associations, which could give you a greater likelihood to not be as strong in your decoding skills. That comes from work by Galliberta and his group out of Harvard who did post-mortem studies and looked for different cortical structural differences in the actual brain, and they found different regions of what they called ectopias, or what they referred to as out-of-line neurons. Now, truth be told, they found these in the control brains as well, but what they didn't find in the controls was clusterings of these ectopias. Why do the clusterings matter? Because these are primary language cortices where the clusterings were found in these individuals with the post-mortem analyses that showed different neural structures and different neural wiring and efficiency of wiring in those left hemisphere language cortices. And they're also major reading zones. And what they proposed is there's potentially some dyslexia susceptibility genes. Dyslexia is not guaranteed just because there's genetic family history. We have identical twin studies. The identical twin studies show that commonly you'll have one twin with dyslexia and one doesn't, and they've got the same genes. So they think it's a tripart model of it's part genetic increased likelihood of probabilities, it's part your response to your genetics and what you're doing with those skills you have, and it's part the instructional information you get or the nature environment you're in in terms of what approach you're being utilized to try to build those skills. So they propose a neural migration problem. They think it's in utero. It happens when the neurons are cli climbing the radioglial cells. It may lead to that differential wiring, which on the microscopic review you see up here, there's an eruption of neuronal cell bodies up into layer one that should have stopped growing and passing in layer two. Because that clusters in a certain area, the belief is potentially that leads to noise in the system. Your signal to noise ratio is, ratio is far less. So essentially they're saying there's a microneurodysgenesis. There's a disruption in the brain neurons during growth and, and it leads to an increased likelihood of developmental dyslexia. They're restating it as accumulated evidence is highly suggestive of a connection between disruptions in embryonic neuronal migration and genetic susceptibility to reading disabilities or dyslexia. So again, the model says potential genetic risk factors leads to less hemisphere cortical inefficient wiring, increased likelihood, not guarantee, but likelihood of poor phonological processing, which means you may struggle more to learn the grapheme, the phoneme combinations that are critical to our language, which means you may struggle more with reading. But reading is a big construct, so it has several parts to it. 
So if we break phenology down in models to try to plan for treatment, we know that the phenological system is going to be built by part oral motor processing, part somatosensory oral motor, part acoustic, and part visual. We think that builds more rich phonemic representations. Each sound has a motoric movement. Each sound has an acoustic property. Each sound has a visual feature when you see the mouth being moved as well. And those differentiators help each sound have four differentiating features if this neuronal wiring is working properly and you're building that multisensory system. That then gives us one system here that's contributing to the building of the actual reading skills, because reading is not just decoding. It's not just sounding words out. But that is one of the earliest developing and one of the most critical reading skills you have. So what are the building blocks for reading? Well, one is we want kids to be able to sound out words. But let's be honest, English, horrible language. Have you ever seen the family tree of English? It's like 10 chefs and one funny looking soup. There's a little too many people throwing stuff in the pot, and it gives it a very high degree of inconsistency and not always a pleasant taste. So you have some words, we teach a child, oh, just sound it out, and the child goes, s, t, op, and we're like, yeah, Johnny, good job. And then we give Susie another word, Susie goes, ya, a, ch, t, ya, ch, t. I'm like, no, no, this one's yacht. It's like, no, no, it's ya, a, ch, it's ya, ch, t. I'm like, no, no, you say yacht for this one, and Susie's like, what are you talking about? Johnny got to sound it out, how come I don't get to sound it out? And it becomes very confusing that we don't have a consistency in the English language. But the other core feature of reading is vocabulary skills. How does that vocabulary system build? When these three systems build strong, then you're more likely to have reading fluency. Because when these processors are working efficiently and you efficiently sound out words, you efficiently memorize sight words, you have good strong vocabulary, you're much more likely to be a fluent, accurate, and efficient reader. But the third leg of that diagnosis of dyslexia was not just reading accuracy, not just reading fluency, but reading comprehension. Now we know from post-stroke studies that you can have a Wernicke's aphasia and have a comprehension deficit and have no impact on your alexia or your agraphia. Your reading and spelling are just fine. So we know the comprehension system is not directly tied to, but it's associated with these accuracy skills in reading. So we look at different models that Slinger and Alexander put out in 2004 to say, we think it's that phonological piece that's the biggest contributor, but some kids actually do have poor visual memory, which makes them struggle to even memorize sight words. Some have poor difficulty memorizing all the phonics rules. Um, some actually have oral motor dyspraxia, so they actually have an articulation, articulation or motor control problem as well, like I just had. Um, but why would you really want to care about the neurodevelopmental model of language development and phonological awareness? It's because it's what we use to drive our treatment approach. So in 1991, we published a paper on 10 kids we did a really intensive intervention with, where we took an early program published by the Linda Moods from 1969, we modified it from a multi-sensory perspective and a neurodevelopmental perspective, and we showed that we actually could make three to five grade levels of gain in a few months of instruction. That 1991 paper became our pilot study for a much larger R01 five-year randomized controlled trial. In this one, we screened 1,500 five-year-olds. Thankfully, I did not do that. Somebody else did that. It takes a special person to screen 1,500 five-year-olds. And they screened them on the predictors of who's most likely to be struggling to read and learn and spell. We split the 160 kids into four groups. 40 of them got no treatment. 40 of them got regular classroom support doing whatever the classroom teacher did. And get this, they got that support 20 minutes a day, four days a week for two and a half years. The question was, maybe the method you used didn't matter. Maybe a little extra one-on-one -on -one time. That's going to be the game changer, and it's going to click for their child. Now reading's going to kick in. 40 more kids got an explicit phonics program. The explicit phonics is straight to letters. What does PH say? What does OU say? What does AI say? And we're going letters to sounds, letters to sounds, letters to sounds, and really building those phonics structures. Because maybe the method you use does matter. Maybe a little extra one-on-ones is not good enough, but these kids got the same time and intensity. They got 20 minutes a day, four days a week for two and a half years. The fourth group was our neurodevelopmental approach. We went back to the sensory neurology of how we think the phonological system builds, and we worked on integrating visual perception of phonemes with acoustic perception of phonemes with tactile kinesthetic perception of phonemes, and what speech therapists know is a bilabial plosive, when you go p, we actually taught the kids to call those lip poppers because now they're learning a metacognition to go along with the sensory features to begin to do early blending, early segmenting, early preliteracy skills that are actually multi-sensory without the actual alphabet letters. Because the alphabet letters are the abstract graphemes. There's no reason why a B says B. There's no reason why a B doesn't say A. There's no reason why a B doesn't say E. 
that's an abstract visual symbol that you have to memorize. And we learned from Piaget decades ago that children learn from concrete sensory information first, the abstract system builds later. So the outcome was there is no difference between these first three groups. It doesn't matter if I give you no treatment, it doesn't matter if I give you extra one-on-one -on -one for two and a half years, or if I give you phonics, 25 to 40 percent of these five-year-olds did not pass kindergarten and first grade. If we gave you this multi-sensory neurodevelopmental approach and went from the bottom up, we built the sensory integration for all the phonemes, we built the, seg the segmentation skills, the blending skills, all without using alphabet letters, and then we transitioned into letters second and built up through the coding skills, up through the sight words, and went through the developmental hierarchy, then we had 91% of children who passed kindergarten and first grade. But the true outcome of a study is what happens when you stop the treatment. Where are they at later on? So we brought these kids back at the end of second grade and measured their reading accuracy and reading fluency. And these kids who came to school in the bottom 12%, they were the highest risk group to not do well in school, are now solidly in the average range of their reading accuracy and reading speed. We let them continue on through school in third grade and fourth grade with no extra interventions, just regular education. And these students' skills are even higher at the end of fourth grade. This study was one of the first ones to show that Treatment was only relatively ineffective in normalizing the phonetic reading skills of approximately 2.4% of the population if we gave this to a whole classroom, not just the 40 kids who were all in the 12th percentile. If we took this same instructional method and in, um, delivered it out to dissemination in a classroom environment, the anticipation is that we would only miss 2.4% of kids with reading problems. Today, it's somewhere between 5 to 20%, depends on how you define it. If you use a more loose definition with broader um, diagnostic cutoffs, you'll get about 17 to 20 percent of kids who have reading problems. If you use a more stringent definition, you're going to get about 5 percent. So simultaneously to that five-year study, we were running another one at the same time. This was not a prevention study. This is a remediation study. <clears throat> we took two groups of 30 kids randomly assigned. We were allowed to do no control group because it would be ethically, uh, be actually unethical to withhold treatment. And we already had well-documented evidence that these kids are not going to progress without some type of intervention. So of the two groups, one group got our neurodevelopmental approach, and they moved from the fifth percentile to the 45th percentile on the ability to decode words, and that happened in eight weeks' time. Eight weeks because it wasn't a treatment study of the efficacy of the program. It was a treatment study of the dosage of what the kids got because, honestly, that's all we could afford to give them. They got one-on-one, -on -one, two hours a day, five days a week for up to eight weeks. So max we were going to be able to give them is 80 sessions. The average was 67.5. And in 67.5, we were able to move the group average from the fifth percentile to the 45th percentile. One year post-treatment, their, their skills dropped a few points, but they still stayed on grade level in the average range. Two years post-treatment, now their skills are beginning to climb up. But the real measure of their skills is also what happens in functional reading at school. And so here's their progress in special ed. This is their skills when they came into special ed. They're scoring a 78 on a reading comprehension measure. And 16 months of special ed later, where are we at? We're still at a 78. There's no functional gain in what's happening in that system right now. These kids then got our eight weeks of intervention, and we made almost a standard deviation of gain in eight weeks' time. And more importantly, when we stop the intervention, here's where they are one year later, here's where they are two years later. Now, remarkably, a statistic I haven't told you yet is, what's the success rate of our special ed system in the United States? What percentage of children leave special ed because they got what they needed to close the gap? Anybody want to take a guess? Five percent. So across the United States, it's estimated that only 5% of children get to grade level in the special ed system and actually leave special ed. That's a 95% failure rate. That's the only industry I know of in the world that will accept 95% failure as the best that can be done. For these kids, before they hit this one-year mark, more than 40% of them had staffed out of special ed. Because when you take a child from the fifth percentile to the 45th percentile on decoding, and you've made almost a standard deviation gain in their reading comprehension, they no longer qualify for services, and they don't need the services any longer. So we've dramatically changed those skills, and that was exemplified by the boy you saw earlier on those two videos. So in 1999, a severely dyslexic man and I opened a charter school. We did it because he had had a horrific childhood. He had been made to wear a dunce cap in Miami. He had been made fun of his whole life. And we did a study with him, and we treated his dyslexia as a case study, and we made such strong gains in his reading. He wanted to help put together a school for kids so they would not struggle like he struggled. So in 1999, we opened the Einstein School as a K through 6, 
But within two years, we had to close K1 and 2. Why would we do that? Because that was my most out, best outcomes of my research was K, five-year-olds. That's the best outcomes. We had to close it because in 1999, let me tell you, it was really hard to get any professionals to refer a kid to a school for dyslexia when the child's five. Nobody wants to be labeled. No professional wants to say, bad news, I think this kid's not going to do well in reading. And everyone says, let's just wait and see. That's horrible. Do you wait and see if an infection gets better by itself? No. Do you wait and see if diabetes resolves by itself? No. The data for us on learning disabilities is small gap at age five will absolutely be a large gap at age six, larger gap at age seven. There's no need for wait and see. We have way too much data now that says it's not going to get any better. So today the school is only grades two through eight. We have 110 kids in the school, and this gives you an example of what one child's progress could be like in a school environment that cannot do one-on-one. -on -one. It can't do two hours a day, five days a week of intensive instruction. It gets, these kids get small group instruction, sometimes one aide or teacher to six kids, and sometimes it's as good as four kids to one aide or one teacher. Depends on our funding, depends on what we're able to do. And I say depends on our funding because when we opened the school, we actually had a funding budget of $1.2 million to treat and provide educational services to 110 kids. Today, our budget, we're lucky if we get 850000 so state cuts to education, other cuts to education. We now, as a nonprofit, solicit more funds before than we ever have done. For the first 15 years of operation, we never asked the community for any help. We took our state budget, we made it work, and we built skills that could actually empower kids. And on state national testing in the state of Florida, we showed double, quadruple, and, sorry, double, triple, and quadruple the gains in aspects of reading compared to the performance on our local county and performance of our state average. Now, You'd think our school board would love us, and half do and half don't. Half the school board love that they can send us their low-performing kids because their scores, their average numbers, automatically go, automatically go up when their kids become enrolled in my school. So they've actually succeeded just by sending us the lowest-performing kids. When we're successful and get them remediated early enough, we can send them back to the regular school without any additional instructional needs. But when they get held on to and they wait till longer and they don't come to my school until about fourth grade, they're probably not going to leave. They're probably going to be there until eighth grade, and we're going to hope to get them as strong as possible before they have to pick a high school setting. From a neuroimaging perspective, we know that typical readers, the left hemisphere is doing most of the work. In a person with dyslexia, whether it's a child or an adult, you see the left hemisphere actually has less activity. In the treatment outcome studies, like what I showed you, this is a study that came out of Houston with the CMOS group. They gave a treatment similar to ours. It was more neurodevelopmental, multisensory based. And what we saw was here's two kids on the top. Both have higher activity or larger activity on the right hemisphere and less activity on the left. Below is the same child after that neurodevelopmental treatment. And what you see is a relateralization of language activity. And you see that correlating with their performance on measures of phonological processing, measures of decoding, measures of reading skills. So we've literally been able to rewire and rebuild and strengthen that network because that's what learning is in the brain. It's stronger network, stronger processing. So we look at red flags for kids. We look at sensory processing flags for kids. We look at difficulties in age two in speech articulation. It's not a guarantee. Every child who has learning troubles does not always have an articulation problem, but it's a higher risk. We look at kids who have trouble using verbs, plurals, and past tenses. They keep saying Pam Shoe and, and lasagna instead of lasagna and shampoo. Those word cutenesses don't go away for some of these kids because their phonological system is not developing on par with their IQ. There's fine motor skill issues. We see kids because the functional neuroanatomy is phonological processing in your superior temporal gyral cortices. That's the immediate neighbor to sensory motor strip. And what's the lowest level part of the sensory motor strip? It's tongue and mouth. What's next to tongue and mouth? It's fingers. So kids who have these inefficient wiring in superior temporal cortex are also more likely to have inefficient wiring in sensory motor strip and leads to fine motor skill troubles, difficulty learning how to cut with scissors, not holding the pencil with a three-point grip. These are all the soft signs that you'll see in a clinic setting that say this is a risk factor. Don't wait and see. Refer for evaluation, OT evaluation, speech language evaluation, dyslexia evaluation, anything that you can do to help get early identification and get access to earlier services. This study and this data doesn't stop with pediatrics. I like a challenge. So after we published those studies and we naively thought we had given educators the answer, I went on to a career, spent 10 years doing post-stroke rehab. And from that post-stroke rehab, the question was, okay, this man has brain damage. Can I rewire the existing neural cortices and rebuild through vicariation, restitution, or compensation new functional skills? In this man, yeah, we did. 
we rebuilt his functional skills, even though he had lost about two-thirds of the posterior temporal parietal lobe, potentially due to a dental um, procedure mistake with anesthetics. Um, <clears throat> but he made a standard deviation of gain in his functional reading skills, and three months later, those skills were even stronger. From an anecdotal unpublished, these are from conference proceedings reports, we looked at the imaging, the fMRI of it, and we saw before treatment and after treatment, there was a shift in the activity of right hemisphere where we saw decreased activity in the right hemisphere from pre to post treatment. And remarkably, we saw increased activity paralesionally after treatment. And we think what we're able to do is if the lesion is small enough, there's still enough residual language cortex that we can reconnect new neural connections, new synaptic connections, new dendritic connections, and rebuild part of that language cortex and that language processing. If the damage was larger, we typically did not see left hemisphere uh, perilesional activity. We saw new activity right hemisphere. And it would start out with large volumes of activity and become smaller as the skills improved, which is exactly what we see in children as well. When we look at it from a three-dimensional fMRI perspective, you can easily see left hemisphere activity three-dimensionally was much less. It's now got a larger volume of left hemisphere activity, and the right hemisphere activity has begun to decrease. So <clears throat> there's been a lot more study on the neuroanatomy of dyslexia, pitfalls and promises. The stuff I showed you about the neurolectopias is now being debated even further. Some people think it's not the right model for this. My focus is I'm more focused on what are we doing treatment-wise. You guys can spend a lot of time trying to figure out the neuroanatomy, but if we already have effective treatments, let's spend more time getting the treatments into place because that's what's going to change the lives of kids and give them better outcomes. Our hope is that this impacts public school settings. We do not want this in the private sector. This should not be in medical clinics. It should not be in my online tech company. It should be in the public sector. We know it's particularly one out of five kids are struggling with a dyslexia base, but we know it's 60% of kids do not read on grade level in our current school system. Those kids are high risk for anxiety disorders. They're high risk for suicide. They're high risk for depression. These things have very perilous potential outcomes, and they need and deserve earlier intervention. I'm speaking to pediatricians almost exclusively right now because you're the first healthcare professional a parent comes in contact with. You are the one they're going to trust the most and you have the best opportunity to educate them about evidence-based practices, evidence-based interventions versus Aunt Susie made this up because she saw it work with this kid number A. And Mr. Gene made up this one because he saw that with his dyslexia, he used clay to shape letters to help him memorize words. And that's the kind of nature of basis of what we have available to kids right now. Parents are inundated with thousands of programs that rarely have any evidence base whatsoever. If they do, it might be one small group study. Rarely do they actually have a larger scale empirical study. And almost never do they have randomized control trials. And what I've shown you today is two of the three randomized control trials we did. The third one we did was just on fluency. Because when we showed the 8 to 10 year olds made large gains in their reading accuracy, the NIH, NICHD group said, yeah, but you didn't change their speed of reading. We're like, well, yeah, no kidding. If we just taught Erin how to ride a bike, we probably shouldn't put her in the Tour de France next week. Because yes, we've given her the skills, but that would be putting her against people who have years of expertise beyond her training. So when we just teach an eight-year-old how to sound out a word, you would not expect him to be as fast and as fluent as the kids have been reading for three years. So <clears throat> we found out from that study with the eight to 10-year-olds that within about one to two years post-treatment, their fluency had caught up into the average range. They needed time to practice using the skills and build the skills. So I appreciate your time. I'd love to answer any questions. The best way to get diagnostics and services is to get to the clinics that have the psychologist or the speech pathologist who have expertise in diagnosing dyslexia. You have private practice settings. You have a nonprofit Alabama Game Changers here that also does dyslexia evaluations. You have clinics within your own hospital setting that do um, reading disability diagnoses. It's just trying to get that assessment soon, but also, more importantly, trying to get them to an evidence-based approach for treatment because these things respond very well to early intervention. Let me say just two things about some popular myths. I don't know of any neuroscientific evidence that shows that children's brains with dyslexia physiologically works differently. 
but that's actually the most common thing you'll hear from educators. So well, their brain works differently. I'm like, well, how does that? I mean, do they not have visual, auditory, touch, taste, smell, vestibular, proprioceptive, or interoceptive? They don't have those systems? Because if they don't, they must have some kind of brain damage. I'm like, no, no, but their brain works differently. I'm like, there's no evidence that there's any physiological difference in how the brain's working structurally. The difference really is the efficiency of the communication from the structural network. These kids had phonological awareness, but they were in the 20th percentile of the phonological awareness. So it wasn't that their brain was working differently. They are missing some core foundational skills, which forces you to try to use other skills. And if you can't sound out words better, you're probably going to try to memorize as many words as you can. And if you can't read well, odds are you're going to spend more time trying to visually imagine things, predict things, conclude things. But there's also no studies that show that dyslexics or children and adults with dyslexia are better, quote, out-of-the-box thinkers better problem solvers, better reasoners. Those are common myths that are floating around today, and they're most commonly perpetuated by adults who have dyslexia who never got effective intervention. And so all they're doing is talking about what they did to compensate. But compensating is like saying, let's not set broken legs, let's just give them crutches and a cast. That does not give the same level of function. Compensation is not good enough when we have evidence-based studies that show that we can actually do remediation and effective early intervention. ROTs are trained in a sensory integration approach that comes out of Gene Ayer's work out of USC. It's a controversial work, yes. But when you combine that sensory integration approach with a neurodevelopmental approach of language, and you're working on sensory motor and language together, they're part of the daily instruction kids get in our medical clinic. So they'll get instruction at least one hour a day, and we'll never do it less than five days a week. Because intensity, frequency, specificity, neurodevelopmental hierarchy, um, <clears throat> duration are all some of the key elements of neuroplasticity. And so we always give high intensity, high frequency interventions because you'll see a faster rate of gain. It actually will cost the families less money. It actually would cost the insurance companies less money too, but they really are stuck on saying, we want OT twice a week for 30 minutes. Well, think about that. The brain's based on experience-dependent plasticity. If I give you low frequency, low intensity experience, you're going to get slow rate of gain. It'd be like me saying that we're going to have Lala learn German, and she's going to get a German lesson two days a week for 30 minutes. Lala's very bright, but she's probably not going to learn German very fast when you only give her practice two days a week for 30 minutes. So we are pushing for the higher intensity, higher frequency, because both the studies in stroke rehab and the studies looking at kids making large gains show high intensity, high frequency leads to faster wiring, faster neuroplasticity, and larger gains in a short amount of time. We're, this gets complicated. Um, <clears throat> myself, no, but a corporate entity, yes. So working with a corporate entity that has the ability to manage multi-state clinics, absolutely. But my biggest push really is the prevention. It's really to get it into as many school settings as possible, which is actually going to require me to do one other thing, which is where most of my energy is today, and that is ed tech. We're building apps, we're building, building technologies that we can push into the school system so we actually teach the teachers less and they're able to do more because the app facilitates fidelity of instruction. The hardest thing about working with educators, and I love educators and I'm dearly very kind about them because my mother is a retired educator so I better not say anything bad about them. She <clears throat> was a special ed teacher and remarkably when my older brother was six and he couldn't read, he got early intervention at age six. Today, he's had a very decorated career in the military, and at times in his career, he reports to a guy in D.C. called the DNI. And for those of you who don't know who that is, that's the Director of National Intelligence. And I can tell you, my brother would not have had that career if he had not been taught how to read at age six. Wisely, my special ed trained mother put me through as a prevention child, because she knew dyslexia galloped through our family. And I'm a living, breathing example of early intervention. There's times when I have to stop and catch myself with spelling errors. There's times when I have to stop and not mispronounce a word. But functionally, I've never struggled. So the goal is push the technology out that helps us get fidelity of instruction. And also, we're going to need those types of transdisciplinary team clinics for about the 2 to 5% who will not be able to be served by the school because it gets complex when there's so many comorbid disorders. When there's comorbid ADHD plus comorbid the unofficial diagnosis of sensory processing disorder, plus there's a, a comorbid you know, dyscalculia or an oral dyspraxia. The more comorbid disorders there are, the more complex it gets. 
that's what confuses parents is because like, no, my child not only has reading problems, but can't ride a bike. So dyslexia is not just reading. Well, actually dyslexia is just reading. As the DSM defines it, it is just reading. Does your child potentially also have other sensory processing, sensory motor, you know, math issues, or ADHD issues? Yes, but those are comorbid conditions. Those are not, the dyslex uh, not dyslexia as is defined by the DSM-5. Right. They're pushing for more screening. Some states have passed the laws. Believe it or not, one of the most aggressive states with passing new laws is Arkansas. And it's not coming from the educators, and it's not coming from the professionals. It's actually coming from a very fierce group of moms and one or two dads. And <laughs> NPR did a study, uh, sorry, did a, uh, I think it's like a 30 to 50 minute um, um, video about these seven people who have led to eight new laws being passed in Arkansas in the last several years. And what they're doing is what actually happened to healthcare. Let's be honest, healthcare didn't become evidence based because we were altruistic and we thought that would be nice to do that. Healthcare became evidence based because the insurance company said, if you do that, I'm not paying for that. And everyone started going for services that healthcare is going to be reimbursing. So what they're doing is the same, but they're trying to do it with education, which is pass the laws that does not give the educational institutions the opportunity to buy less than evidence-based programs. So we're trying to bring education into evidence-based practice, but it's really more like kicking and screaming to make that happen. For and like right. We know that if we can get Head Start doing more multi-sensory based speech perception activities, which means you're combining visual plus acoustic plus tactile kinesthetic of the mouth, teeth, and tongue, and lips, and building that full phonological awareness system by oral expl uh, uh, exploration activities, just you know, verbal activities, mouth madness activities, that's a chance to potentially make it stronger. But we also have um, a pre-K version of what we did in our early, in our early intervention. The pre-K version is trying to get that into the Head Start programs and not needing diagnosis. Let's just give it to all the kids because the research I just showed you was neurodevelopmental models based on how we think the brain typically learns to read and spell. So we've taken that neurodevelopmental model of the typical development and we've combined it into a treatment program with high fidelity, high specificity of instructional levels and we can give that to a whole class and then the kids who are weak get stronger. But the kids who are strong, they get stronger too. So you essentially take that bell-shaped curve of your class and just raise its performance. So that one's going to be through the neurodevelopmental ed tech company. That nowprograms.com is the one that does the pre-K work. It's nowprograms.com. That's the ed tech company that's building the um, resources, building the infrastructure to provide teacher training and build the ability to get these evidence-based methodologies into school settings. Is there a role for primary care? Do you think nutrition should be screening, say, preschool age children, not to really diagnose dyslexia? Right. To identify those who are The risk factors, yeah. And you're going to have a real good tool for that very soon because Boston Children's Hospital has been building an app just for this for the last two years. So hopefully very soon, Nadine Gab and her group at Boston Children's are going to release an app. It's free, and if you can get your parents to put their kid on that app and bring you the data, it's going to give you some preliminary indicators of their phonological awareness, their working memory, and several other domains that we know are critical for better development. For now, when you don't have that, if you just ask the kid to say cat without the k sound, if you ask the child to say flame without the old sound, and they're four and five and they struggle to do that, that's your bedside risk factor indicator. If they have any fine motor issues, if they have any body coordination issues that don't seem to be right on par with that developmental milestones, those are other risk factors. But your number one risk factor is family um, existence. Anybody in the family already diagnosed with dyslexia. Or in some of these generations, they didn't get diagnosed, so you have to ask it more generally. You have to say, anybody in the family who was not a good reader, not a good speller, was told they weren't college material, and were steered to some kind of trade that was hands-on. 
Because when they say, yes, oh yeah, my dad was never a great speller, you know that your patient you have right there has a far higher risk for dyslexia, and it's important just to tell the parents that. Say, we know part of the um, exposition of uh, learning disabilities or dyslexia, that expression is going to partly come from genetics. So if you have that family history, just know you have a higher risk. And even if your children get effective intervention, like my kids both got effective intervention. My kids have never been to special ed in their life and both went to college on scholarships, but their children are going to be higher risk. Because we're not changing the genes, we're not curing anything, we're not fixing anything, we're just taking the less efficient systems and making them stronger to improve the functional skills. Sorry, at the back. Yes. Yeah, the, the data that I showed you, the question is, does the system actually make it more likely that kids are going to have reading problems? The answer is absolutely. Because what I showed you, and from 1992 to 2017, the system has made no improvements in its literacy rates. 36% of children were proficient readers in 1992, and it's still 36% in 2017. And it's not because their brain works differently. It's not because they were genetically given some superpower. Gene dyslexics don't have superpowers that were genetically endowed. If you spend a lot of time making mental movies in your head, you might build a strength, but it wasn't given to you because you had a genetic risk factor for dyslexia. But so the system is absolutely has to be one of the major contributors because the system shows that right now over 60% of children across the country do not have functional reading skills. Here's some more stats that are in the, my TED talk. If you don't read on grade level by age 9, 40 to 60% of those kids will be in jail or on welfare at least one point in their life. If you go to the juvenile justice system, you measure literacy in the juvenile justice system, kids under the age of 18 who committed a crime, it's upwards of 80% of those children have impairments in their reading skills and meet criteria for a learning disability of reading dyslexia. We go to the high school population. We know that in the U.S., 17 to 20% of high schoolers drop out, and some studies show even as high as 80% of the high schoolers do not have functional reading skills. And it doesn't stop there. What happens to those high schoolers who drop out? Let's go to the prison. Let's measure literacy skills in prison, and people are doing more and more of that, and we have rates between 40 to 80 percent of men and women incarcerated are functionally illiterate to such a degree they can't even fill out a job application. So these things have potential grave outcomes, but they're very easily preventable by changing the system and helping provide it with better evidence-based practice. Yes, is true. Exactly. Exactly. And in Florida, you can write with a pen and you can poke a pen into the cork board, but they're both called a pen. And in Trinidad, they'll ask if you want to go see a flim. And I said, I don't know what a flim is. What is a flim? You know, at movie town, we're going to go see a flim. Like, oh, a film. Oh, okay. But in Trinidad, flim is an acceptable pronunciation as well. Yes. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.